Okay, uh, it's my absolutely pleasure to introduce Robin, Robin Phipps. Phipps. Uh, she is an alumni from our university, but uh, uh, took since that her own uh, pathways and currently she is in uh, Massey and there she's the professor of um, construction and the director of the research for the School of Build Environments. Uh, Robin is for many a well-known figure here in the construction and architecture field in New Zealand. Uh, obviously also due to her uh, extensive research and uh, looking at performance of homes, schools, uh, particularly looking there at heating, ventilation, energy efficiency. So really they, uh, a lot which uh, sits very close to what we do in our school in the building science uh, program. Uh, Robin is uh, interested in uh, universal design, health, safety, uh, and see of how that all can come together. Uh, Robin is the co-director of the Kanga Oranga Health Housing Research Group uh, and was presented with uh, 2014 with the Prime Minister uh, Science Research uh, Team Prize Award and she is also the director of the New Green uh, Building Council and a trustee of the Property Foundation and a member, uh, founding member of the Indoor Air Quality Research Center. This is just a couple of highlights of what you are undertaking and I believe in your talk you will give us a bit more especially the lessons learned from uh, the research you do and I'm really looking forward to get this overview at the end we have uh, the possibility to discuss a little bit and uh, engage in, in some of the points which you raise and see how we can respond to that so with no further ado thank you for uh, taking uh, the in invitation up and uh, we have the chance and opportunity to listen to your work. Thank you, Robin, it's all yours. Thank you. So I'll just do share screen and pull yes. up a presentation. Oops, sorry, this was here all a minute ago and it's disappeared, there we go. Yep. Is that sharing? Uh, not yet, not yet. Um. Yes, now, now it's sharing. Okay. Yeah, perfect. It's now coming up. Wonderful. Okay. It's good. And can you all hear me loudly enough? I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation to um, come and talk to the School of Architecture today. Um, I've had a, been very, very blessed to have had a lot of research opportunities um, have opened up for me along my career path and have had a some great um, projects to have worked on, which have been able to make a big impact for people. And it's all about how does the building environment work better for people, whether it be the worker or whether it be the user of the building. And here is just a couple of the, the, the themes that we've been able to, to do. And I'm gonna use the word we quite a bit because it's very much team research. Um, it's, it's not an individual pursuit, and it's not just a messy pursuit. It's, it's very much um, cross-institutional and um, with the CRIs, such as NEWA and GNS. Um, the first study that I want to talk about is a reasonably old one, but there's some good lessons that came out of this. And so this was the, the Heating, Housing and Health Study. So it was a big study funded by the Health Research Council. Um, it was about a million dollar study and it followed on from the work that the Hikainga Aringa had done looking at when we replaced the, um, an uninsulated home and gave them a little bit of insulation in the ceiling and subfloor. It had a huge impact on health and so but the homes were still too cold. They got one degree warmer 
but still not up to the WHO standard of 18 degrees minimum. So the next step was to say, well, what happened if we put a little bit of heating into the home? Because we know that about 45% of New Zealand homes are too cold and they're too damp. And also unflued gas heaters are used or were used in about 30% of New Zealand homes. And the emissions that come out of these heaters are primarily nitrogen dioxide, formaldehyde, a whole lot of other volatile organic compounds and um, moisture and carbon dioxide. So we wanted to look at what was the benefit of replacing either an unflued gas heater or a small portable electric heater, which we put into the study as well to kind of mask that we were looking at unflued gas heaters because of some difficulties that people who were in Australia had come on, um, faced when, with opposition from industry when they were looking at unflued gas heaters. It was obvious that we wanted to try and mask what some of our research question was. And so this was a, a pretty big study where we replaced either a, a small electric heater with or unflued gas heater with either a heat pump, a wood pellet burner, or a fluid gas heater all at the expense of the study. And if the home was uninsulated, we provided ceiling and underfloor insulating as well. So you can see why the, the budget quite quickly ticked up just because the cost of the intervention was reasonably significant. We had um, over 400 families, all with an asthmatic child, um, child between the ages of seven and 12, old enough they could blow into a picometer, but young enough that hopefully they weren't smoking. Um, and this was the main part of the study. And the bit which I led of this was a nested study where we intensively monitored 53 homes in two, over two winters. And these homes were based in the, the Hutt Valley. Um, so the main study, we were looking at daily symptom diaries, um, lung capacity on a daily basis, um, recording absenteeism from school or work for the parents. We were measuring temperature, relative humidity, nitrogen dioxide with um, an average over a month long period and energy consumption and um, health outcomes. We're in the intensive study. We were using um, a chemiluminescence meter, which is a, um, a box bigger than a, a desktop computer and a, a pump that had to drive it, which was a very noisy pump, need a lot of soundproofing and careful placement um, to drive those devices. And then some smaller sensors for carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, relative humidity, temperature, formaldehyde. We vacuumed floor dust from a square meter and we analyzed that dust. We found even some red panda dander in that dust, which was quite interesting. And we had some slides where we were looking at what was the propensity for mould to grow. And so this was just the, um, the intervention that we did. The result from the main study found that children um, who had the replacement heater had significant health benefits. And these health benefits included three days per winter off school for a respiratory illness, to your GP visits, less medication use. And the results were seen that they were so significant that if the same health benefit had been found from a new generation pharmaceutical, it would have been considered a success. So in this case, heating was the medicine. Um, in terms of in the main study, again, we when we put a little bit of insulation in, we got the home one degree warmer. With a bigger heater, we only got another one degree increase in temperature. And again, we're still too cold and not meeting the WHO recommendation. But possibly more significantly, there was a 5% drop in RH or a 6% drop in RH in the lounge room in these homes. And that Reduced RH means less exposure to um, some of the byproducts of relative humidity, such as dust mites and mold. So, I mean, it could be that a lot of the benefit came from um, having a drier environment. 
from the intensive study where we were instrumenting the homes very intensively and taking real-time measurements, um, this is a, a, just a graph of um, the temperatures inside the home. And as you can see, the homes with the unflue gas heaters were still way too cold. So they're a long way off getting to 18 degrees, especially in the bedroom, because we were assuming that the heater was primarily in, in the lounge room. We had one home, and this is an N of one here that was totally electric, that was nice and toasty. Um, I'm not quite sure what their power bill was, but I, I imagine it was reasonably significant. And the other intervention homes were getting warmer, but still not quite hot enough unless those, uh, except some of the homes with a heat pump. But if you just hold for a memory that the unflued gas heater homes were not meeting uh, an acceptable temperature with the amount of heater that they were using, but unfortunately, even with not enough heater use to get to temperature, we were having some really excessive levels of pollution that was being generated. So this is um, data from one home. It was an average home. And the top graph is the nitrogen dioxide levels in both the lounge room and the child's, the asthmatic child's bedroom. And the dark blue line is, is a thermocouple on the heater. So we knew when the heater was on and off. And what we can see is that as soon as the heater gets turned on, the nitrogen dioxide levels in both the lounge room and the bedroom shoot up. And in this home, they were three times higher than what is uh, the guidance level by um, WHO. And one home, it was six times higher within 10 minutes of the heater being turned on. When we look at the formaldehyde level, we've got some background formaldehyde noise, which is unrelated to the heater use. And this could be hairspray, cooking, it could be a number of sources that were going on. But again, when the heater gets turned on, we've got um, exposure of formaldehyde in the lounge room and in, in the index child's bedroom. And um, 0 0.08 is the level that we should be, the guidance level we should have, be having for a 30 minute exposure. And you can see we've got significant exceedances of formaldehyde with the heater use. So what we found was that um, improving a heater um, was um, highly effective for a health outcome. And it also, it was highly effective for removing pollutants from the home. And when we were running an unflue gas heater, we very, very quickly had pollutants right through the whole house and it was distributed into the child's bedroom, even if the heater wasn't there. Now this was a very extensive and expensive study and you probably don't want to do too many of these in your lifetime because they're actually quite taxing to be able to coordinate all the community workers, 400 households, um, a huge amount of equipment that had to be moved around. And a study of this big makes you rethink how do you do research method. Um, because we were able to show big impact and with some of the other studies, we were um, very fortunate to um, be awarded the Prime Minister's Prize in 2014. And you'll see in this photo here, um, a couple of people who are well known in the media, including Michael Baker, who's one of the faces of the COVID response and a couple of politicians. We, um, having run a number of very successful interventions in homes, we decided to have a look at classrooms. And one of the catalysts for this work was um, a piece of work that had been done by Brands and a follow-up study that had been done by Jackie McIntosh, your very own Jackie McIntosh, where she had found that CO2 levels in classrooms were too high. We'd done a little study that said that teachers um, only 40% of the teachers never open a window. Um, and the reasons for that was they didn't have a caretaker to close it at the end of the day. They were too busy teaching. It was too hot. It was too cold. It was too noisy. It was, the window catch was broken. 
was too awkward. Um, so for 40% of classrooms never had any ventilation in the classroom. And an awful lot of teachers assumed that a heat pump was bringing in fresh air. And in addition to this, the Ministry of Education has capped energy budgets for all schools at the 2010 level. So there's a CPI adjustment, but um, if a classroom decides that it needs to have more ventilation, there is no money to run a mechanical system. So there is a great need for energy efficient heating and ventilation. So we put our thinking cap on and realized that classrooms are operated between the hours of roughly nine to three, which is about the same time that the sun should be shining. We based our study in Palmerston North, as it's not known as the solar mecca of New Zealand. We wanted to get something that was relatively representative, not too good, not too bad. And also it helped out a lot with logistics as the team was based in Palmerston North back then. And what we had was 12 pairs, sorry, six pairs, 12 classrooms of match classrooms. So classrooms side by side where we had exactly the same um, building condition, different occupants, but the same building. And we put a solar air heater onto the roof of the classrooms. So this is a panel which is um, one meter by three meters. It's clear um, polycarbonate on the front and black felt inside. Nothing more ex exciting than that. Air comes in through the black felt and the perforated plate on the back face. The PV panel on the side here drives a small fan and um, it pushes air into the classroom when there's sun to drive the fan. Um, and these are the, the measures that we, um, the parameters which we picked up in a classroom. So temperature, relative humidity, carbon dioxide, heat of use. We looked at particulate matter. We swabbed um, the children's throats, all the children who assented to be part of the study, five times a year for two winters. And we've actually managed to get the biggest database of asymptomatic children throat bacteria. We didn't actually set out to do that, but that was a, um, a bit of a bonus from the study. And we're still trying to um, get some microbiologists to help us analyze that data. And we looked at school absenteeism. So what we found was that um, uh, we looked at both the classrooms when they were occupied and unoccupied, so that we were seeing both what happened with the presence of children and being CO2, sense, uh, CO2 contributors. And we looked at them when the classroom was unoccupied so we could see the effect just of the building and the solar air heater. And what we found was that for most of the time, the solar air heater was producing heat in a Palmerston North winter above 18 degrees. So there was useful heat, free heat. And for most of the time, we were able to increase the temperature in the classroom by six degrees. Unfortunately, we weren't getting sufficient airflow through. We were getting more heat than airflow because of the, how the controller algorithm was set up. So we weren't quite getting sufficient carbon dioxide reduction to, make, um, to meet the standard that we wanted, but we were getting useful heat for free in the classroom. And we got really good feedback from the teachers, such as it got rid of the smelly sock smell. Um, but one of the lessons from this was the units that we used were $5,000 for, a, for a, a small sensor like this, and the, the formaldehyde sensor beside it was another $5,000. These instruments were not covered by Massey Insurance because our excess is $10,000. So I had sitting in the field thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment with no insurance on it, which is in a classroom with um, robust kids. We did build this beautiful little cage to try and protect the equipment. Um, we don't win a furniture award for the cage. Um, but it was functional and none of the equipment got damaged.
but it was concerning that there were they were going to be unplugged or buttons pushed. And because it had limited memory, we had to um, continually go back. We checked every equipment every week and we had to make sure, and we had to download data because we didn't have sufficient memory on um, the instrument. So that meant that there was a lot more intervention and um, interruption to the schools than ideally we would have liked. And so this learning about difficulties with instrumentation led us on to another project, which I'll talk about in a moment, which is where we decided that how do we do it cheaper and smaller and with an internet of um, uh, capacity so that we actually don't need to go into the, to the school to connect or collect the data. And so working with computer scientists and product engineers and a whole bunch of people, we developed our own sensor for under $400. And so this is, is, is almost as good as what we saw in the previous slide, but for a fraction of the price and it's internet connected, also has an SD card for backup, but we can put these into a classroom and um, they can collect data for a year at a time without us needing to go back. And so we could also learn about occupant behavior and to give real-time feedback to see how that worked. We developed another project which was funded by Curious Minds where we created what we, the first one we created was we named Skimobo, which is a school monitoring box. And then we created Skimobo Plus, which has got a little screen, which gives either a smiley face or a sad face, depending on what the conditions are in the classroom. And the idea of this was that it was going to prompt a teacher or a classroom monitor to open a window or a door to bring in some fresh air. And we created an educational program aimed at primary school children, which we called science, and a room in a box where they learned about carbon dioxide levels and, and how did it impact and condensation and a few basic science STEM tests on that. And, and we are still using these Skimobos. So we have for, two, or for a whole year, we put the Skimobos into 35 classrooms, mainly in the South Island. Um, and we ran those for a whole year to, one, to check on the performance of the SCMOBA, but also to learn about baseline conditions in classrooms. And a surprise finding from that was that the CO2 levels were highest in summer. And the reason for this is that the teachers are shutting the windows, flicking on the heat pump, and keeping the classroom nice and cool, but rather cooked. Um, and so this is going to, this is a, a, a surprise finding and um, we're talking to the Ministry of Education about this in terms of how do we now redesign a classroom so that we actually do bring in ventilation and cooling or ventilation and heating because this seems to be something that's not working at all well for classrooms at the moment. Um, Building on from those current surveys, we've got some more PhD students uh, following on from this. One in particular is um, a very capable student, Lara Tuki, who is doing some work based on what does it actually mean to cognitive performance when the CO2 level goes too high. So we've purchased some EEGs. Um, which are little caps that you put on your head and they measure your brain waves. And from that, we can see what we can play with um, CO2 levels and see what is it performance change over some standardized tests. U was the, the student who did the solar, air heat pro, the solar air heater project that I talked about. And then we've got some other projects that are, um, are ongoing as well. Um, so there is a progression. Um, I mean, one of the big lessons that we learned was the need for instrumentation. 
because if we can bring the cost of a project down, it either means I can have more homes or classrooms that can be studied and the logistics become significantly easier. And this had been a barrier um, in order to achieve funding to do studies. And the advent of um, commercially available EEG equipment, we've now bought some new stuff, which has got eye tracking as well. So we can actually see what is happening to the student in terms of their eyes. Uh, Ministry of Transport are also looking at this for driver fatigue. Um, so we've got some interesting work that is going to be able to come out of this where we can actually see what is the, the built environment or the enclosed environment doing for people and how do they perform in that space and cognitively. So that's a, just a couple of the projects that we've talked about. And um, I mean, I could go on for long, but I won't bore you with that. Um, so I'm happy to take some questions. You're muted, Mark Arell. Thank you very much. Um, that was a really nice um, overview and insight of uh, some of the projects you did. And I really like the um, direct outcome and the hands-on, uh, which trickles down to, to, to kids, basically. Right? So it, it really covers from the, the researcher and the really research aspect, but to end users, which are not the typical end users, or they're affected by what, what we do, but they le they're learning about it and it gives them a pathway to understand where they are and, and actually what research is. Th that, was, that was really quite fascinating to see um, nearly how, how easy it is. <laughs> I know it's not, but it, it looks so, you know, ap approachable, accessible, said, yep, I, that's nice, that's, you know, the, the, how you how you structure and what you do that I, that is it's really enjoyable uh, yes so maybe i uh, uh open the floor now to anybody who uh, attended to give any comments uh, to the, the presentation to to robin hi i was going to ask about the approaches that were used in especially in the earlier housing months were all active energy rather than passive so um ap applying heat um in inserting energy into the place uh, in order to combat the situation of uh, dampness and the um humidity um i just wonder what your thoughts were i can see on this last slide carbon neutral and low energy buildings but i'm used to you from the uk of um, insulation thickness, uh, double glazing, draft ceiling, and trickle vents as being um, the kind of fundamental ways of of dealing with this uh, in a contemporary way. Do you think there's a, a positive movement in that direction and potential in in New Zealand, both in housing and in schools? Um, absolutely. And we've, we've got quite a bit of talk about this. So um, we do have a project that we um, were about to do field work on um, at the beginning of this year, but we have, for obvious reasons, um, not gone to the field yet, where we are selecting 50 or 25 homes that are built to code and 50 homes that are built above code. So these are either um, home star rated or super home or passive home. And we will compare them, we will match them as closely as we can, number of occupants, number of bedrooms, floor area, and geography um, to homes that are to code. And we'll look at the energy use and the indoor performance in those homes. So that's a project that's meant to be happening. It's kind of stalled, um, but it will get back on track with that. So we've got one student who's looking at the performance of the homes and another student who's doing the analysis um, of looking at, you know, if you've gone for a passive home, you might have more embodied energy in it, but what does that mean over the life of the home? So right. we've got two projects on that. And we've got another student who's going to be optimising solar air heaters. So we, we weren't getting quite enough airflow through so let's see how do we actually get better 
heat exchange, heat absorption, um, so we can actually get better heat. So you, absolutely right. Let's look at, for new homes, what do we do to, to build better? Dot once, dot right. Uh, okay. I, um, sorry, I should have said at the beginning, really interesting talk, which it was. Um, but the, uh, the other issue is a lot of existing homes have issues to do with um, uh, energy loss and mold and et cetera. Um, have you got um, kind of a, uh, an easy checklist of these are the most effective things that we can do for the typical New Zealand home, if there is one, uh, um, that's suffering from these issues? So um, the top student here, Phoebe, was able to take the three brands house condition surveys where there had been a lot of work done on measuring subject of mould and dampness, um, objective dampness and housing um, parameters. And she has done a big study, a, a, quite a deep dive and analysis onto those factors to try and work out what were some of the um, inherent baddies. Um, maintenance was a, a big one, subfloor dampness, um, and um, certain types of claddings came out worse than others. In terms of where to go for improvement, um, you know, the obvious one of insulation is, is a, an easy win, and then improving windows seems to be the next most important. Um, we are trying to get funding at the moment for another study where we just replace windows. We were going to do that in some retirement village where they were going to do that anyway, and so we were going to monitor it and use it as a natural experiment. So one of the lessons I learned is you spend a lot of time chasing dollars, and if we can use a natural experiment it's absolutely fantastic because then the intervention is paid and then all we need to achieve is the funding just for the, the research rather than having to pay um, fortune, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for um, the intervention as well. Um, so if we can achieve it where the um, windows are being replaced with um, double glazing, with trickle vents, then we will be following that, that as a project. Okay, thanks. All right. I was um, wondering whether one can match actually health data, so uh, people getting sicknesses with the um, with your research around um, the, the the heat and the toxicity uh, which is uh, admitted, and so whether there is a relationship of general health of Basically, um, sick buildings, uh, what I call that, and and normal building and and uh, buildings where we don't have that impact. I mean, I mean that's a, that's a very good question, Mark. Um, there's in the international research, it has there's a very strong pool of evidence that shows that dampness is connected with health measures. So where there's been a lot of meta-analysis done of big studies, they've been able to um, verify that dampness and health are linked. It, nobody to date has been able to um, prove that mould and health are linked, but that could be a lot because of individual variability just like one person can eat peanuts and the next person can't. Um, uh, yeah. you know, we all have different susceptibilities to you know, in allergy levels to mould and things. So, so mould and health is not linked, right. but yeah. dampness is. But, uh, you know, maybe it's not that direct link between the mould and so but uh, also what you showed earlier with the heating about the, the toxic uh, uh, PE and so on, that, um, uh, when you switch on the heater, that one sees people who are in uh, not uh, substandard housing conditions have go more often to the doctor. So it's that, that can be because their general health is not so fit, but there is maybe a relationship between the environment they actually be exposed to all the time versus uh, and their health. Mm. Oh, and th there's a lot of confounders in there, such as diet, access to healthcare. Right. Um, 
you know, uh, and it's, it's certainly not able to be a, a totally controlled experiment mm -hmm. because there, there are so many other confounders, but, which is why we do need to be able to have a big study so that those confounders get um, randomized across both the intervention and the control group. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we, do we have any other comments from colleagues? Um, I have a little question. Yeah. Hello, Robin. Lovely to see you, even if it is via Zoom. Um, uh, one of the elements that you have mentioned in the presentation was the increase of formaldehyde levels um, when the heaters were on. And uh, we spoke, I think, some years back about the fact that um, formaldehyde emissions are likely to be higher in New Zealand in summer months that are damp, like December, uh, simply because of the humidity relationships. So the heater and the increase of humidity could be the trigger for the increase of release of formaldehyde. Um, would that be your hypothesis for interpretation of that bit of data? Um, it was for one home. So there was one home, we, we had asked all the homes not to, um, we, we had tried to filter out homes where they had any planned renovation work going on or recarpeting or anything that could be a formaldehyde source. One home did repaint um, in between, in the middle of our study and their formaldehyde data was off the scale. So we did not include them um, in our analysis. I think that, um, I mean, we tried to do another study where we actually had um, the inflow gas heater and we tried to put it in a chamber and just measure the emissions coming off the chamber. And um, we did find that quite a bit of it was generated just by the heater. Um, because obviously you want to, as you say, eliminate as many of the confounders that are in there. You turn up the heat and, and you're going to get um, you know, formaldehyde coming out of some other material. We didn't see the formaldehyde increase with the other heater types. It was with the unflue gas heater and when we did a, a small test in a chamber, we took one of the worst heaters. We had one heater which was probably about 20 years old and um, the occupants donated it to us at the end of their study and we actually tested that in a, in a sealed room and we found that there were some really terrible things coming off that. Yeah. So it's a, it is a combination. And in terms of looking forwards, um, um, a lot of this sort of stuff, especially what Mark was asking about uh, um, health impacts, I know how difficult it is to quantify anything in the area that, that we're both exploring. Um, uh, but um, as you do the research that you're doing, are you collecting or setting up elements to make it possible to do a longitudinal check later on with the same subjects? Because one, something that could be easy to do now is to just plant a little seed for a future contacting of the same people. Um, and then if there is funding, et cetera, um, follow up and see what has actually happened. That's an, an excellent idea that we actually do go back and see what, especially what changes in behavior um, have occurred and we haven't done, we haven't provided for that in the ethics applications that we have done so far. So one of our um, policies of our projects has been no survey without service. We don't go into a home to survey what they're doing unless we're providing them with something, whether it be um, a winter energy payment or insulation or a new heater and so uh, philosophically going back and looking you know two years down the track five years down the track um, we would um, it, it is the philosophy of the research group that, that we would need to give them something else because most of the homes that we are oversampling are low income homes and we, we don't want to bother them um, unless there's something in it for them too. Um, and so we would need to think very carefully about how we would actually set up a longitudinal study. There is a couple of longitudinal studies. One is the Growing Up in New Zealand study, and we've tried to look at how we connect in with that. Um, we haven't, we've had a lot of useful conversations, but we haven't actually got that working yet. 
and that would be really interesting because that's where there's so much known about um, education of the parents, education of the child, education of diet, um, Plunkett books. You know, it's a longitudinal study and to be able to look at what is the home of that child now would be really fascinating to see. Um, and, you know, if we can make that happen, it'd be brilliant. Um, I have found that uh, even with, with simple surveys, sometimes people and self-declared kind of responses without a lot of intervention or asking them to do a lot could be quite valuable sources of information. So, um, uh, and integrating something down those lines when you're giving them whatever you're giving them could be an option. Um, it just seems that it is that longitudinal impact mm. that we are actually really interested to quantify. Mm. So thinking about how to plant the seeds now for potentially something um, uh, could be really lovely information for the future. Agree, yes, absolutely agree. Are there, we have any more comments? What, what I felt coming back to the, the school kids and, and an entity there is that uh, you actually show a very interesting path for students to go into the research, but not pure science, but more the built environment research, which is uh, probably not necessarily at the forefront of people when they think of science, they go maybe it's more the uh, typical courses in, in STEM and uh, that you will actually be an ambassador of what you do uh, to, to open it and see, you know, it's not pure, it's, 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 there's other opportunities. Uh, do you see that through your work, what you do, that has an impact on the students which come to your, school, to your university, to your programs? Um, it, it's too early to see where the, the children who we've engaged with the, the, the room in a box type science mm -hmm. in terms of what they do with careers. Um, where we've been talking to teachers, um, the teachers have been really interested because it's, it's experiments that um, the children can relate to really easily. And therefore it's, um, it's fueled some quite useful um, science fair type projects where the, you know, there's an individual inquiry for the students and, it, and the students have really enjoyed the work that they've done. Right. What would be, I mean, following on from what Amina said, it would be really nice to, to go back and see what is the stickability yeah. of that. You know, once we take the instruments out of the classroom, are they still opening the windows or, um, you know, has behaviour changed beyond having the instrument there? Mm -hmm. Or do they need the instrument there? Or does the instrument after a period of time just become, you know, background noise and, and they cease to notice whether they need to mm -hmm. respond to it? Right, yeah. What age group were the children where you had the instrument? They were primary school. All right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, would you consider that maybe run a similar experiment with high school students where they obviously have a different mindset and um, probably also other interests which then would have that impact in terms of their career development? That'd be really fascinating to do. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and I think they'd be really good to, to take, um, to, to sh showcase careers, especially yeah. in science careers, but do it in a way where it's educational rather than um, promotional. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, I mean that. I, I no, I, I don't see that as a pure promotional exercise because that would be the wrong thing, right? But uh, to to have basically develop a different bonding between uh, students in an age where they think about what they do and uh, and open that up and by that you know get also a different engagement for for your own research. Yeah. Good. Uh, uh, can I uh, maybe um, encourage anybody else who is attending to give a feedback? Regan, yep. Hi, Robert. Hi. Really, really loved your, your equipment. You know, really good equipment. 
Um, in fact, I'm quite lusting after it. It looks really fantastic gear to stick in a classroom for a year and have a you know, huge amount of data. But, uh, and particularly the, um, the headset, because I can see why you've done that, because while we're looking at the uh, indoor environmental quality, really in a school, we're trying to figure out how does that connect to the, to the outcomes for, for students. So I can sort of see why you put the, that, that piece of headgear onto you know, that student and you're measuring, you know, Lara's doing the study to see what the connection between indoor environmental quality and, and outcomes is. But at the same time, I wonder whether there are other issues, other socioeconomic issues that are impacting. And while they're young students, that may not be an issue, but I wondered whether, you know, the other issues that are happening around them, you know, well, COVID being one, perhaps, mm -hmm. possibly, but, you know, the economic situation, if you're in a lower decile school, then you would be in a higher decile school. I know I'm probably treading on unsafe ground by talking about, you know, decile schools in that way, but um, those schools that are economically more endowed than those that aren't, that the economic and the social factors may actually outweigh the um, environmental ones. Any, any sort of, do you have any sense of, of that in the work that you've done so, thus far? Um, what, what we've found is that the lower decile schools were, um, we targeted lower decile schools for the solar air heater study. And um, all the schools that we went to were decile, um, below decile four, apart from one school, which was a decile five. And the teachers and the principals were just so grateful for anything that we could give. They had um, children in the school who were rheumatic fever positive. So they were very, very concerned about those children. Um, and, and one of the things we did with all the throat swabs was we had a community nurse who was testing all the children, and, or nearly all the children, in, in a class. And regardless um, of whether the child self reported a sore throat, they had a follow-up if they were strep positive. And um, they got medical intervention, which upset our study, but it was absolutely the right thing to do. Um, so they were put on to doctors' follow-ups and, and antibiotics. But um, yet there is a huge amount. And one of the things that we found was um, with the strep throats was that it wasn't so much... Uh, there, there tended to be a community of bacteria that was more akin to the family, the school community, so different schools had different sorts of bacteria that were in their throats. And so it might not be the environment, it might be um, community transmission. Big, big, interesting one to untangle, which is why we've parked it and we've handed that data over to a microbiologist to try and untangle because it's well outside my ability to understand. Right, yes, yes. Uh, do, just and following on from that, Robin, do you think we are moving closer to being able to say to policymakers and you know, in the education the education department uh, to that a focus on indoor environmental quality is as not to say as important, but as as significant as the economic and social factors, which they seem to you know you know to do automatically. Um, and not really look at, you know, daylighting, acoustics, ventilation. Do you think we're getting closer to a point where we can say that the you know, indoor environmental quality issues are as valid as the social and economic ones that are happening outside? I don't know that we can say that they are as valid, but we certainly are talking a lot with the Ministry of Education and, um, and also the work that Mike Don is doing. So Mike Don and... Inkley, is it, um, have been doing some really good work in classrooms as well. And, um, you know, we, we actually have a um, Mike and, um, or the Vic team and, and Massey team will be presenting a webinar for the Association of Learning Environments in Australasian one in 22nd of September, which is a really interesting association because there are both researchers and principals and teachers and um, sort of in the ministries who are all there who are 
looking at what is the impact of the built environment on education. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, the dialogue is happening. I think we've got a long way to go, a very long way to go, but it's nice to have the door open and the engagement. Right. Yeah. Good. Um, I think we have to wrap it up at this point. Um, there is another presentation coming at one o'clock and we have to sort of hand over things and I uh, want to give you all the chance to now go to, go to lunch. I really appreciate that you uh, invested your time, that you shared the project with, you, with us. I'm actually now really intrigued to see all the things which you have and I hope that uh, when the lockdown is down and you come back uh, to Wellington and have the opportunity that you maybe uh, have a little show and tell session about the, the work which you have so that we can and you similarly playful engage with your research and uh, that we can have a, a further discussion around that. Would love to. Yeah. Be my pleasure. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank so you let very us much. Know, let us know when you, you know, if uh, once you come back here and have a bit of time, then we can sit together. That would be lovely. Okay, so I bring the session to a, to a close. Thank you, uh, Becky. Becky is uh, actually managing this whole uh, atrium talk session. She's now online. I uh, appreciate everybody coming and joining. Thanks for the comments and feedback which we heard. And I uh, hope I see you now in the next talk or in any other occasion. And Robin, definitely, you know, sooner or later. Thank you very much.